rising. <laughs> Good morning. I'm going to um, to welcome everyone to the Zoom um, to our Shamans Directory live event this morning, and um, and I'm going to just make some short introductions. Veda, you look gorgeous at eight o'clock in the morning. I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone around the planet. We are delighted to have you all with us today. Um, feel free to use the chat to let us know where you're from and say hello. And um, I just want to quickly do a, a brief introduction. Um, I am Trisha Bennett. I am one of the founding members of Shaman's Directory. And I, I am co-hosting this morning with Mayumi Beckers from the Netherlands. Um, we are both um, part of a team of people who have been working for just over a year to um, create a directory for shamanic practitioners and healers from around the world. Um, we are answering the call of the prophecy that has been resounding across the planet for over 100 years that we will only heal when we all come together around one fire and offer our medicine together collectively for the healing of humanity, the earth and all living things. So after uh, a year of very hard work, we are delighted and a bit hesitant <laughs> to say that the doors will be open at the end of the month. So that means within seven or eight days, the doors will be open. So we are very excited about that. And um, today we have with us um, one of our ambassadors and our ambassadors for Shaman's Directory are those people from around the world who have stepped in and said, yes, it's time for all shamanic healers and teachers to come together to leave at the door whatever separates us and to come together around one fire to offer our collective healing. And I met Veda a couple of months ago with another one of our ambassadors. And I'm just gonna ask that people mute themselves when you enter um, so that our, the sound doesn't get interrupted. Um, that would be wonderful. And, um, and so I met Veda through one of our other ambassadors and she and I had an opportunity to talk about her work with water. And if you are aware of shamanism at any level, you know that one of the fundamental principles is that everything is alive, that everything has intelligence and wisdom to offer. And when I had a chance to talk to Veda, I realized that her relationship with water is not only unique, it's extraordinary. And she calls herself a water researcher. And after reading her book, I now refer to her as a water whisperer. <laughs> so I just wanted to say a, a little bit to bring us all into the space of water. And I know she will say more, but just to get us all kind of thinking about water that, you know, the symbology of water is everywhere in our world. Water is a symbol of the unconscious mind. It is, it is known throughout every culture in, in sacred ways, the cup is known all over the world as the holder of water and the sacred, the womb. We think of water as the depth, we go to the depth of the earth. Um, water runs underneath the flow of life underneath us, um, the water that is the source of everything. We refer to fountains all the time, to rivers, to the sea. Um, and the last thing I, that came to my mind was the, the, Im, the image of a well and the symbology of a well, the feminine principle, the womb, the great mother, and, and really of a well being a sacred portal. And I feel like Veda, I feel like you are a sacred portal. 
you have really created a sacred portal for all of us to experience water in a way that probably none of us have considered. So I want to welcome you and um, let you tell us a little bit about yourself and the history of your relationship with water. Well, thank you and hi to everybody. And firstly, I want to apologize if my line sounds a little crackly because my, my computer sounds a little bit like a hissing cat all the time and it needs to be fixed. So hopefully you can bear with me. Um, I'm so happy to be here amongst all of you. And when I think of water, I think of water as being the elixir of not just life, but love. And water has really taught me so much about what it is to have self-love and love for nature. And really, the two go hand in hand. There really isn't uh, any separation in that way, only in that humans on the whole tend to think of ourselves as separate from nature, but as we know, that isn't true. And so within my relationship with water, and um, just so you know my background, I'm from New Zealand, my father is Maori, and we have a saying in our culture that the health of the river reflects the health of the people. And so what I have found over all of these years is that one of the ways in which we have relationship with water is actually really about having relationship within the waters of ourselves we don't tend to think of ourselves as bodies of water. Uh, this is because we're encased in this, in this kind of skin suit or meat suit. But in fact, by molecular count, not by volume, we're 99% water. That means there are more water molecules in our body than stars in the Milky Way. And I think that we're, we are actually made up of these immortal things. We're made up of water, of which doesn't die, Humans give water the term dead water when it's polluted or when it's not structured or whatever realms of watery kind of groups you might be in. But in fact, water will always transmute and it will go from a liquid into a gas and it is literally reincarnating before our eyes. The other thing we're made up of is salt and minerals. And even when you're cremated, the actual acid, the acid, I've got, the, I've got this kind of science thing going on in my brain. I was talking to a scientist just before, but the ashes are actually salts. And so the salts themselves, they are a crystal. So when you look at a little tiny cube of salt, you'll see that it has a cubic structure. And when you um, put it into water, it makes this incredibly beautiful marriage. Both of them, then the, the, the salt completely disappears and you can't see it anymore, but you can still taste it. And when the water evaporates, the salt is still there and you can't even go through the process of cremation without the salt still remaining and the water evaporating. The other thing we're made up of is consciousness of which we simply can't <clears throat> disregard. That is such an important part of who we are and I say it's an important part because whilst we're in this physical realm and we've chosen to be in this body, in this world, it has a definite role to play. Uh, the body, the, um, the fluids within the body, the soul and the spirit, and all of nature, we're all working together. Our body is shedding its skin cells. It's doing all of these things regularly. So in, in many ways, we are anew much more often than we think we are. And so when it comes to water and relationship, for me, when someone says, when did your relationship with water begin? I kind of have a little chuckle inside, but I'm like, we've never been without water. Water is our companion from the moment of actual conception to the, to actually, I, well, I was going to say to the moment we die, but I think it is with water that spirit actually um, leaves the body. I think water and consciousness are so intimately entwined that they behave as if they're one. And I see this because I've spoken to many people that have had near-death experiences and uh, they say one common thing. Uh, when they say, them, they say that they feel themselves rising, which is what water does when it begins to evaporate, 
And then they looked down upon their body, and the three of them, all of them, they said, oh, I hope that person's going to be okay. So they had become the observer. And from my experience, what I believe to be true now is that we have these two types of water inside of us. And this two types of water thing has been following me now throughout the nine years that I've been a water researcher or a water whisperer. But really, water's always talking to us. I think it's more about listening to what water has to say. <laughs> and we're all bodies of water and we can all do it. You know, one of the things I have been seeing a lot of, and I will get back to what the two water thing is, is that people, when they see my work, and I work, my, my area of expertise is in crystallography, and I found this very specific way of freezing water. It's a very short-term method where water kind of splits into two types of water that I call informed and uninformed. And when I project a conscious thought or inspire the water with a photo or um, a song, music is a powerful one, all different kinds of, you can really, it's, there's, you're only limited to your imagination as to what you can, how you can play with water. But, um, but what I will see is that an image will appear in the ice that is relative to the influence, like the thought of chocolate or, a, or an actual piece of chocolate. You can put, put the, um, the petri dish of water on top of the piece of chocolate and actually then freeze it using my technique and see the chocolate appear. So what I've discovered over all of these years is that this two types of water thing is really important to me. So if you imagine that when you were a child, uh, you might have been given a piece of paper and a glue stick. And you get the glue stick and you may draw a picture on it. And then you put some glitter or some sand and you sprinkle it on top. And the, some of the sand will stick to the glue and some won't. And then you pick it up and you shake it and the rest of the sand just kind of falls away. And then you have this kind of sand or glitter picture. Well, the glue is kind of like your conscious expression that some of the water has adhered to. And the very first freeze, so water freezes in layers, which is really interesting to watch because when most people think of frozen water, they think of this big kind of ice cube. It's quite thick. So I only use a very thin amount of water, a very small amount of water. And after about five minutes, what you'll find is there will be a liquid on top. That's what I call the uninformed water or the water that simply didn't pick up um, as quickly as the other types of water. So it's the kind of water that was most attracted to your frequency or most attracted to the image or most attracted to the words or the, or the, the music. And the rest of the water hasn't had a chance to freeze yet. And if you can get the first freeze, you're getting the very first impression of what the water has picked up from you or what the water has to tell you. And there are there are very two distinct things there. Because you may have heard of Masaru Emoto's work, where he was um, a, a, a Japanese um, scientist who basically was showing people that thoughts, words, and all these kinds of things impact the water um, structurally. So what he would do was have like two glasses of water, one with love, one with hate, and the one with love, he'd take a drop of that and flash freeze it and then get his microscope and take photos. And he would see that the water that had been ex had ex expression of love put into it would form like snowflakes. It would form beautiful geometries. Whereas um, the water that had had the word hate put it on it couldn't form structure. So although he was not embraced at all by the scientific community, what he did was open the gateway, the doorway, for people to think of themselves as bodies of water that are sensitive to their environment and sensitive to their own thoughts. And it was a very powerful way in which he, he showed people, because the speeches, the pictures speak a thousand <laughs> words. Um, so when I kind of saw his work and another man's work, and I don't know if you'd like me to share any photos or anything, um, but I, I, I can if, if you would like me to, but 
We would love that. Yeah. Okay. So I might talk you through, because really, like I'm saying, a picture speaks a thousand words, but until you actually see my work, it's very hard to really know what I'm talking about. So um, I'll just make sure I can screen share there. So just letting you know that this is um, uh, for somebody else, like, like this kind of, um, I put this together. So anyway, that's that. So this is just a Moto's work here. So just a very small example of, of it. And so you can really see the structural changes. So the next person's work that many people don't know about is this man called Laurent Costa. He's also taking microscopic photos of water. Um, but what's so interesting about his work is that he's not just seeing geometries, he's seeing faces. And so he's getting hearts, he's getting fish, he's getting these specific faces. And what's so cool about his work is that he doesn't think of water as something that he wants to experiment on. And I'm very much of the same mindset. I'm a body of water that doesn't want to be experimented on either. And so he simply is like looking at the water and smiling at it. And then he's flash freezing it and looking through a microscope and taking photographs and he's getting happy faces back. And so when I saw this, I'm like, oh, that, that just makes me smile. Whenever I see a happy face, it actually gives me a human response. And when he's expressing love to the water, he got the most beautiful, perfect heart. And I really wanted to know if I could do this work or if water really stored information. And I, I always say, don't believe everything you see. Don't believe everything you read. Like, try it for yourself. And so back then, I didn't have a microscope. Um, and I really wanted to try something. And I could see that the, the real kind of magic seemed to happen in the freezer, in the freezing process, where the invisible becomes visible. There was one last man that inspired me. His name was Thomas Hieronymus. And basically, he um, was a radionic engineer, and when he went into a Parisian meat market, he observed that the freshly placed organs of an animal appeared to be affecting the way the frost froze on the glass behind where they were placed. For example, the frost would form in the shape of a liver organ above an actual liver organ, and so on and so forth. And so his hypothesis was that there seemed to be some kind of life force energy still emanating out of that organ based upon the fact that there was still water in the blood. And what I was excited about when I heard about uh, what he had observed was that he was seeing it with his naked eye. So I'm like, well, that's interesting because even Rudolf Steiner suggests that you look at the way the frost freezes on a butcher's window compared to that of a florist's and you will see there's a difference. So as my journey um, began, I, I wanted to see if water could do this. So I had a healing journey with water um, and this special type of water that's in New Zealand is a spring, beautiful spring water. And um, so I put some of that into my Petri dish. Just People always ask me what, how, what kinds of, do you only use that special water? No, I've used water from all over the place, all different kinds. And I was holding the Petri dish like this in my hand in, in the photo and there was a little bit of fluff floating around it. You might even be able to see it in there. But there was a little bit of fluff floating around in the dish. So I was like, oh God, so I put my hand in <clears throat> to take the fluff out, consciously thinking, I wonder if my hand will have any impact on the water's quote unquote memory. Then I put it in the freezer with the peas and the broccoli and the ice cream and all the stuff and I forgot about it because I had no expectation of what I would see. This was not coming from any other place but curiosity. And so a few hours later I came back. I'm like, oh yeah, there's that Petri dish. I better get to look at it. So I, um, I basically took the Petri dish out, held it up to the light and took a photo. And, um, and this is the photo that I saw, that I took. And it takes up half of the Petri dish. So this is huge macroscopically. And I don't know if you can see, but I, I have inherited my mother's bent fingers. And you can see that my bent fingers are in the ice, a hand here. So I was kind of like, 
shocked and almost a little bit freaked out when I first saw this because I'm like, I wasn't expecting to see something quite so obvious. And so I, I actually went to my son Rama and I said, hey, hey Rama, what's, what is this? Because he didn't know what I'd done. And so he showed me, I, I mean, I just showed him the photo and he was like, it's a hand, mum. And I'm like, it really looks like a hand, you're right. And then I was like, well, is this just a coincidence? So then I went down to the beach because I thought if any water's going to be informed, surely it would be seawater. Um, and then I got this photo from seawater where you can see the um, tail and the outline of the fish and the perfectly round eye and the fins. And it's feathery because salt water freezes slightly differently than fresh water. And so then I began to realize uh, a, lot, a lot of things. Like I talked about with my technique, and as you can see um, in this picture, this was how I used to do, because I didn't know any better. You know, you kind of go along in this thing and see what's going on. So uh, this is what totally frozen looks like. Still very cool, but this is what my new technique looks like. And as I became more and more familiar with the new science of water, I actually um, became more and more familiar that there is a fourth phase of water. There's a liquid, solid gas, and then a type of gel. And Dr. Gerald Pollack, Pollack talks extensively about this fourth phase of water. And that's actually the kind of water that's inside of our cells, but you can also have fourth phase water in other water. And so as water begins to freeze, it goes from molecular chaos, where it's in, when, when you have a glass of water, it's updating its information every trillionth, trillionth of a second. And then as it begins to freeze, it goes into a more structural order. It becomes actually, they call it liquid crystal because it looks like the same lattice-like molecular structure as a crystal. And in fact, humans are liquid crystal because we're salt water. And so as I began to understand that, I started to think I was missing something by freezing water for such a long time. So I started opening my freezer earlier and earlier and earlier to see where it was at. And that's where I discovered this other type of stage. And so over here, this is actually the photos taken by my son. The whole thing was done by my son. And um, his name is Rama and from the, the Hindu god Lord Rama. And we were talking about how Lord Rama always had a bow and arrow. So he was projecting the thought of an arrow into the water before freezing. You get different colors coming through. You will see that as I start to show my work. The reason for that is that it's a very thin layer of ice and all the background colors and sunlight play into the factor of that and you see lots of colors coming through. So I worked professionally as an oil painter for 12 years. So I see the world from a very artistic point of view. So I love it when colors come through. But there are scientists that are doing this work that kind of um, try to keep it very much not as artistic as me and so um, however people do this is really up to them the most important part and not everybody understands that is really about forming relationship with water and I really want to talk about that uh, for the most part I'll skip through a lot of these but this is how it looks so it forms where there's a liquid on top and there's an ice underneath you can see it's only a small amount of water and and you tip the water away and you photograph the crystallography. Um, so light and water, so this is an important one. An indigenous woman once said to me that um, basically she could speak to bees and trees and she would watch the beehive for long periods of time. And she said that a bee came out and in its own way, it told her, please don't watch our hive for too long because your consciousness is putting too much light into the hive and we like it to be dimmer. And that then made me start to really think, you know, what we put our consciousness towards is also what we're putting our light into or towards. And so within this relationship with water, um, I believe that water uses light to design as it freezes. And light is such an important part of what it is to be uh, um, alive. And so what I captured in this photo is that 
these shoots are ice shoots. They're the first kind of shoots that tend to form as water starts to freeze. Um, but what you see here is that it actually, each one has a type of light around it. And I believe that it actually is able to use the light. The, the light creates the pathway for the ice to follow. And that is part of the design work. So it's actually a very interesting um, phenomena that's going on. Um, I, th I knew that water liked to design an imagery, so I used different people's photos. This is my friend Wendy. I put the petri dish of water on top of her photo for 30 seconds, froze it using my technique, and you can see that it's designed her face. So, just so you know, it's not random. I have 64,000 photos of water doing this, so it isn't random. But I've done a lot of work in the last four years on something that I call hydroglyphs, and they're ice symbols in water that I have done repeated studies on to get one hydroglyph. I need to have written the same, the same word over and over and over and over again at least 50 times, and done the tests 50 times, and seen the same, basically the same symbol. Um, and there's reasons that I do that. So someone asked me to do a picture with Sadhguru, so you can see that that's Sadhguru's face right there. Uh, I've used random things like Roman coins. You can see that there's the pictures there. Um, now this one was slightly frozen, too frozen, but you can still there see that the face has appeared in the ice. Um, there's hundreds of them. I've just given you a little selection. So here's a little selection of some uh, of different ones. So where you can see what the whatever the influence was prior, um, and on the right side, and the results are on the left side. So you can see in this one, I've just put my thing, thumb in the water, and you can see that it's there. Yeah, it's interesting because if you look up here, there is like this little kind of circle on my nail. And a few hours after doing this this um, this work. And after seeing the crystallography and noticing this little dent, um, I chipped my thumb in exactly the same place, which is interesting. Um, my son did this one. And, I mean, you know, this is liquid water going in and these images coming out. It's important to, like, recognize this is, like, incredible work that art is, that this, this artist that is water. I, I say often that, um, art is the heart of water. Um, this is a very impactful one. There was a, a woman who was pregnant and she was in her early stages of pregnancy and I asked her to drink some water and um, I'll just enlarge it so you can see here. I asked her to drink some water and leave me some to freeze and this is what I froze and you can see the, the little baby in there. This is one of my more funny stories in that um, I was at a cafe and this dog, that this like looks like this Schnauzer dog, was drinking out of the dog bowl they had out for thirsty dogs. And I'm like, oh, I wonder, I wonder if the water would show it, what, what it would show about the dog. And so I went to the waitress and I said, do you think um, I could get a little takeaway cup for the dog bowl water? <laughs> it must have been one of the craziest things I ever asked. And she looked at me literally like I was nuts, and she's like, um, okay. And so she gave it to me, um, and I simply went home and froze it using my technique, and literally it's like an etching. It's so amazing. This photo is in the middle is impactful because um, I used a book. My daughter had a, a big book about all different kinds of birds, and I put a piece of cardboard halfway down the owl's face, and I put the petri dish of water on top of the piece of cardboard so that it wasn't right in touch with the other half of the owl's face. And it designed the other eye. Um, and as we go through, there's, I mean, there's so many. Um, here I've just used broccoli water, and you can see the broccoli. Um, I've used a daisy. Um, another dog, you can see it's clearly a different type of dog. Uh, for the ones where I've used media, I've basically just sat, sat the petri dish in front of a movie <laughs> and left it <laughs> and um, come back later and frozen it. And so, um, 
this is kind of one of those things where there's so much of it that it's hard to deny. If it was just one or two or three, you'd like, eh. But, um, but I post every single day um, on social media. And it's, it's an interesting one, having to have that relationship with the world and with social media and posting all of this very amazing, intimate stuff. But I have to remember that water is um, using its visual voice for a reason. And I have to get out of my own way and step in into some worlds, because you might not know it, but I'm innately shy. I, I am an absolute geek. I will stay at home and just like not go out uh, quite happily. And um, but I, I need to I need to do this because there's always going to be something that's bigger than you that you have to get up for. And so when you're working with, um, especially when you're working with elements, you know this is this is not just some random thing that you can not pay attention to. This is something to pay attention to. Just like in the book Charlotte's Web, I don't know how many of you have ever read that book, but basically there is a, a spider in the book. And <clears throat> to get the human's attention, the spider thinks, how, how can I do this? So in it, her web, she writes words and human words to get their attention. And so this is a way that water is there to, to, to get our attention. And what I like is that there is a threefold model, and that is science, art, and consciousness, and that is an interweave of that. And so what I suggest to people that struggle with this work to kind of get their head around it or their heart into it is just say, look at it as art. And that way you're not throwing it out as just like something of no importance because art has importance and significance. Um, I asked Water if it knew my name. So this is how I write my initials. This is, I never showed the water this, um, but just this is for you to know, this is how I link my initials. And it designed its perfect VA. Um, this story is beautiful. This is my mum over here. She was a walking angel and she passed away in 1999 and this is me. And um, so basically I was missing her and I said to Water, can you please connect to my mum? And when I was, um, oh, and it was a while ago now, um, I was living in Japan and um, this was before cell phones and before emails and uh, my mother and I would write letters to each other. And at the end of every letter, my mother would attempt to draw a circle. Her circles were terrible. She'd be the first to admit it. They always looked like misshapen rotis uh, and put a heart in the middle. And so when I froze the water and I saw that, that had major significance to me because I'd seen that on every single letter that my mother had ever written to me. And so now I do it every uh, year on her birthday and I keep seeing it. And so this one was, um, I did for a, a man. Actually, it was very interesting because he's a big water guy. And he said, oh, can you put a couple of Petri dishes out overnight so all my friends can send love to the water and send me birthday wishes and we'll see what happens. And so I thought, yeah, sure. And I did that. But I added a third dish because I knew his father had passed. And I said, could you please connect to um, my friend's father? And what was curious was that when um, the next morning I came out to do the freezing, uh, I put the same amount of water in each dish. So each dish had exactly the same amount of water in it. The two he knew about had the same amount of water still there. But the one for his dad had actually like, been evaporated to only a very small amount of water. And it was a, one of the most curious things. So I just froze what was left and everything froze into this heart. And then I showed him and it was really something special for him. And it was interesting because I don't know, his dad had passed only within that year. And I don't know whether maybe his dad hadn't used some of that water for energy 
or there was some interaction that happened there. Again, I, I really am not sure, um, but something significant happened. Whereas my mum had, has been gone now, you know, for over 20 years. Um, so this is my latest work. I think this is really important. So just to, to kind of recap, I've, I've done so, I mean, literally thousands and thousands and thousands of photos, and I'd love to show them all, but I, I think that I would like to talk a little bit about hydroglyphs and their significance, and then I'd like to just talk about this kind of observer effect that I began talking about earlier, water as the observer, because I, I really think that's an important topic. So to get you really up to speed with more of my latest work though, um, I used to, well I, I still do, I, I, but I've done, I've done a lot of work with music. So as you may know, I'm sure most of you know Emoto's work, he really showed um, water in, in contrast. So he used classical music versus heavy metal. And heavy metal formed, didn't form structure, classical music formed lovely crystals. However, I'm pretty sure that the person that did that probably really hated heavy metal. And I have never known water to be in judgment, ever. And I think it's important to remember that. And my son, who's now 20, he said to me, Mum, he said, you know, I don't really like cl classical music. He said, I, you know, I'm driving around listening to my music, but it isn't classical. <laughs> he said, does that mean that the water is hating everything that I'm listening to? And is the water in my body disordered and all this kind of stuff? And I said, no, I don't think that water is in any judgment whatsoever. It is responding to different frequencies and sounds. And it's also responding to you. Your thoughts, your feelings matter. And so he said, well, I like rap. He said, you know, I like, I'm listening to Tupac and all of this kind of stuff. And I'm like, well, sometimes I listen to Tupac. You know, nothing wrong with a little bit of variety. And I also love to listen to chanting, and I love to listen to some, you know, I, I like all kinds of music, as many of us do. And so I went on this rampage of like doing all genres from African drumming and like uh, chanting and um, electronic music and metal and this and all kinds, like Bob Marley and Little River Band and all this stuff. And what I saw was that water really just loves to design. It's designing all the time. So for example, the sound of om creates these round circles that look a lot like the um, circles inside of a tree trunk. And I've done multiple studies of that and it keeps showing me this similar design. So in my arrogance, I thought, oh, well, you know, the sound of a gong is probably gonna look similar to that. And I'm like, and water always reminds me, as soon as I think I know what it's going to do, it won't play with me or it will show me that I'm wrong. And so what I found was that the sound of a gong definitely didn't do the round circles. What it did was design a gong with a mallet on top. It designed the instrument. And so as I'm going through this work, it water simply will not play with you or me if we are in a space of arrogance or full ego. It's very compassionate. If you're sad, it will certainly give you uh, um, some kind of uh, response. But it doesn't play in the realms where there is frustration, anger, or um, arrogance. Um, and you can't manipulate it which I also love, because somebody said, oh, well, can you trick it? Fair enough. And, I, and I, I did this a few years ago, and I don't know that I could even do it now, because, because it doesn't feel good. But I did this thing where basically I said to the water, um, well, can you show me a beautiful picture and that's just for me? But in my mind, I was like, and I did this on purpose, but in my mind, I was thinking, well, you know, I'm going to show this on social media and it'll probably be a thousand, ten thousand people going to see it. 
And so it was an, it's mani that's manipulating someone or something. So basically, um, I did everything I normally do and water just simply wouldn't design anything. I'm like, oh, thank God. Because one of the downfalls that happened with Tesla and Victor Schauberger was that their work was taken into the hands of others that had, were going to use this for something that wasn't good. This work doesn't, this, this, the water just doesn't resonate at that frequency. So if you take it to use this for anything that is not good, water reads you. It reads intention. It's so incredibly sophisticated. And so, and it's so compassionate that it actually has, is able to have conversations with us. And so with these hydroglyphs, I call them that, that because they are like glyphs and they actually have a lot of commonality with ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs and that they are, this is a conceptual language that is not designed to be spoken, it's designed to be felt. And so, um, as I mentioned earlier, you need to, like I need to have basically used, I use words for hydroglyphs. So, for example, I, here I use the word imagination. I write the word imagination on a piece of paper, put my petri dish of water on top of it, freeze it using my technique, take it off, freeze it using my technique, and then photograph it. And what I have discovered, and the reason I told you all about the music, was this is where this started. So, um, I used the song Stairway to Heaven. And... Uh, I started to notice that this stairway would appear in the ice. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And I did that multiple, multiple times, like 12 times, and I kept seeing the stairway. And I'm like, you know what? I wonder if that actually means stairway. And so then I'm like, oh, well, I mean, I'm going to write the word and see what happens. So when I wrote the word stairway, I got the stairway in the ice. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Then I did it again and did it again. And over the course of a couple of months, I did it 50 times. And I'm like, I think this means stairway. <laughs> and, then I, and then I thought, well, what do you do with a stairway? Especially within the realm of that song, you climb up it. So I wrote the words climb up and I got the stairway. And I'm like, oh, now I'm beginning to realize that this, this, this has layers of meaning. And now I have something like 35 hyd hydroglyphs, which has taken me four years to do because it takes such a long time. And I really do them all in one hit. And I think it's actually more um, powerful that I don't do them over and over and over and over again. And that I do them every couple of days or every few weeks because you can see it's not random. Um, it's not that it's just picking up from the information from the last dish, all this kind of stuff. Um, and so for the word imagination, you can see it, it forms these, um, these stars. Now, what I like to do is liken it to something in nature. So I've just done this uh, here. So this is 64 examples of this happening. So it's, this is the frilled angle. It's hard to find something that looks like. This means message. And so I'm working with a small group of people from around the world, from Slovenia, um, Af um, uh, Australia, all throughout the US, India, all using different waters. Um, all different cultures, different thought processes, you know, we're all different, and we're all seeing hydroglyphs in water. And what's interesting is that um, we've frozen um, urine, a lot of us have started to freeze urine, and even within urine, we can see some hydroglyphs, not all, but some, which is extremely interesting. Um, now, this is a very beautiful, um, I mean, they're, they're literally everywhere, and they're really, really quite stunning. But it's almost like this looks very similar to the hydroglyph for information, this, this pattern on top of it. And so there's a lot to know. And so I feel literally like an infant in this work. Even though I've been working with water for nine years, I've been doing the hydroglyphs for four years, trying to then figure out how to understand the messages 
the, the, the complexity um, and, and sophistication of this symbolic language, I'm reaching out to people to help me because I do not have all the answers. And so um, as people start to do this work, as people go on workshops, as people get to learn how to do this for themselves, um, I have a, a private Facebook group of people that are all doing this work and sharing work. Um, and they all have my technique, and well, they've been on a workshop and then they know how to do this. And so um, I, I handpick some that have just really committed and you can see that they're posting every day and they're really seeing it. Um, and because hydroglyphs have layers of meaning, they have multiple meanings, um, more now it's not about doing the repeat stuff because I've done that already. What I want to find out is what the other meanings are. And I will say that water doesn't read words. This is important because people say, oh, can it understand different languages and symbols? Of course it can. Water isn't reading the word. It's reading the energy of the word. So um, now it's interesting because money and abundance are two different things. And someone said, oh, it seems like a man-made construct that money would appear um, in, uh, in this. And I'm like, well, there's a few things I'd like to say about that. Firstly, um, as so beautifully put earlier, uh, the significance of, of wells and wishing wells have been around for centuries. There has been an intimate relationship between humans flicking a coin into a well and making a wish. And in the very earlier part of that, it was believed that there was a deity uh, that lived in the well, that worked with the water, that was it had a choice to grant you a boon or a wish. Um, and so this, this idea that, that coins have been placed into water for, for a kind of a hope, a dream, a wish, is not uncommon. Um, in ancient Rome and, um, and Greece, when someone died, they would put two coins on their eyes so that is payment for the ferryman to take them across the river to Hades. And so even if you look at the shape, it is a disc, it's a circle. The circle is one of the most ancient symbols all around the world. And so water is, has this language, it's communicating with people. Of course, you then have to think, well, what does money mean to you? This is really every single time something comes up, like there is an image like this one, for example, um, you have to kind of go, well, what, what does water want me to know about the significance in this respect of money? Is money um, energy I can count? Is money something, because money isn't actually, it's neutral. It's only the, the worth we put on it that gives it value. And so I think within this realm, water is having conversations with us. One of them may well be about something to do with abundance or money. And that is a real world thing. Can't kind of deny that it is. It doesn't, it's, it is one of those things in which in this world today is around. And we are bodies of water. And I think that that's something important to remember is that the body of water that we are is also going to be having conversations. So it may well be that this is just a vast vocabulary. And I, and I think that that's important. Plus it's picking up the energy of the word, in which case it's showing us that it understands that word. So I think it's important to remember that too. Um, this is a really important one. So, and, and I've done many, many, many more of these because it has a lot of layers of meaning. Living is one, gratitude is another, healthy is another, and death is another. Now, death isn't a mistake, just so you know. Basically, um, death, as somebody asked me who was told that he only had a few months to live, and he said, can you please ask water what death looks like? So I did the technique and I kept seeing the living glyph. I'm like, wow. Why do I keep seeing the living glyph when I'm showing it death? 
And I came to the realization, of course, that water doesn't die, it transitions. And so in the realm of water, just a little reminder how much water we're made of, by molecular count 99%, um, basically water transitions. It doesn't die, it doesn't understand or see death the way we do. And so when I showed the image to him, he really was so relieved because for him, he really took that as a message to say that, that it just, we just transition on. And certainly that's what I'm seeing in this particular realm of work. Um, and the winter tree means change. Um, the lotus means enlightened, enlightenment and purity. Um, the emanation means free energy. I, I, I threw this in because I think it's really, really interesting. When you think of energy and free energy, um, this one looks like a pyramid with these incredible geometries coming out of the top. And you can see them all here. This is very interesting. So one of my favorite hydroglyphs that I have is called the creation glyph. This is your standard creation glyph. So for the word creation, you will see these seeds down the bottom and this kind of watery fire. Now, there are four transitions so far that I've discovered of the creation glyph. These are all the creation glyph at different stages of freezing um, and melting. And sometimes they just come out the freezer like that. So this one here doesn't have the seeds. It's just got the waves. And this one looks like feathers. And this one here looks like speckles. So what we're actually seeing is fire, water, air, earth. So within the creation glyph, it's actually got all the elements, which is remarkable to me. And ether plays a massive role in this. And yet I don't, ha I don't know what that looks like quite yet. Um, this is the word pharmaceutical. And I, this was actually made for this this other podcast I did, but still, I need you to know that I did this prior to the pandemic. This, a lot of these were done before that, so this was not me projecting any feelings about anything, but just so you know, um, I, I did this before the pandemic even started, um, and it also means chemical and it means poison. And what's very interesting is that I'm actually seeing this glyph in water I shouldn't be seeing in it at the moment, in certain out um, water sources that are open. I haven't yet seen it in deep underwater aquifers yet, but I have seen it in some rivers um, of which I really shouldn't be seeing them in. So that's saying that there's some chemical, some various different things that are happening in the waters. And I think it's good for us to hear that. Water does show us its journey. Um, some people ask water to show, oh, show me about my day that's coming. But water just shows you about its day. And it will show you the different pathways it's going to go along. It will show you what's actually it's been through. It will show you its journey. Um, and this is addiction, which is kind of similar <coughs> to, um, <coughs> to the pharmaceutical glyph in that it's got a sharp point but it's smaller. It also can mean sugar and abuse. So other potential meanings mean that I've done at least 20 or 30 and I'm nearly at 50. So I just can't 100% say it because I haven't done 50 yet, but that's just my specific gauge on things. I just love that here's what the stairway looks like, just as an example, so you know after me talking about it. The love creates hearts. And this is the tree of life, which means wholeness. Now, what you'll see over here is that on the, there are these circles on either side of the tree. Those two circles are a hydroglyph for lungs or breathing, which is so perfect given that it's a tree. Um, when you read this, it means um, breathing into wholeness. When I asked water, what is a hydroglyph? It replied in hydroglyphs. It gave me the living glyph and the message glyph. It means living messages. Um, here you can read it. 
the heart is inside the fern hexagon, it means basically love lives in gratitude because it lives and it also means gratitude. <clears throat> so it's inside of it. So how we start understanding the meaning, this is, this is basically, I think, up to each individual person because these are designed to be felt. And whenever you do this for yourself, it is a message for you. I can't tell you what water's telling you. You know, have to learn to know what that means for you based loosely upon what I'm discovering. But I am not the be all and end all of knowing everything. Far from it. Everybody has the ability to start to learn to understand these important and sacred messages that water is giving us. Um, but water is very sensitive to our thoughts. And so the closer our relationship becomes, um, the more intimate the relationship becomes with water. And I, I will pick up on that. Um, so this one, again, this I, I, I'm just telling you this because this was for another, an, a, another podcast um, for these people, these doctors that were specifically wanting to know more about this particular topic. So uh, I often wouldn't show this, but it was really early in the morning and I'm like, oh, I've, got, I've got to, if they want to see something, it's right there on my, on my computer. Um, but you may find it interesting anyway. I was on the phone to a, a friend a while back that was very nervous about getting her second vaccine. And um, she didn't want to. She, she was feeling really upset about the whole thing. And there was a lot of stress going on in her life. So this here, this band with these lines coming out is the hydroglyph for stress, anxiety. Uh, these empty, cir these, these stars, they mean to imagine or think about. Um, you can clearly see the two syringes here, the two pharmaceutical glyphs. Water has understood. So they, I was talking to her and then I put the phone down and I froze the water. So she was simply in my awareness and consciousness and I was thinking about what she had been talking about and water picked up on that and, and showed me. And when I showed her, it actually made her go, whoa, my body is made, I understand. She, she related this to herself, this image. So this was a message for her to show her that water completely understood, her body completely understood what she was thinking and had designed it in front of her eyes. It's like basically um, your thoughts being crystallized and it impacted her so much that she actually went straight into doing some um, much deeper yoga practices and started really trying to realize that, well, not trying to, she did. She realized that that stress was creating these spikes in her, literally. Not the kind, and, and she just, she didn't get it in the end. She didn't go for it. She didn't get the second vaccine. And um, she, I always think we should be allowed to choose whatever we want to choose. Personal health freedom is important. Um, and, but this picture spoke so much to her personally. And it said more than, than I think I will know what, what was going on inside of her. Um, <clears throat> these are important. And I think this is helpful, especially within the healing community. So you can take tap water. <clears throat> so I've done, for a couple of years, I worked for a couple who in my job was to identify the different crystallographic structures of individually and different types of water. So what their signature patterns are. Tap water is very disordered for the most part. It doesn't create very much geometry. Um, spring water, for example, will show those beautiful fern hexagons like the living and gratitude glyph. Um, so when you put water into a singing bowl and then play it, so I put the tap water into the singing bowl, played it, and then you can see it's transformed its structure. You can see it's turned into this kind of swirl and it's loosened up and it started to come into more, um, more order. And I think that it's important to also say that there, within this realm of study, I've observed that water has an energetic state of health, much like we do as people. Um, I say that because tap water doesn't change chemically, it changes structurally. So, I akin that to a, an emotional state of health. 
very similar to people. So if someone is very sick, or say a doctor tells them that they have a disease, they can be happy or sad still. Someone can come and give them a hug and tell them, my God, you look beautiful today. And, um, and that might just make them feel great. And within that space, um, something structurally is changing. The doctor could tell you you're still sick, but there has been a change. And you see this, I see this over and over and over again with different modalities and different conscious expressions, that there will be a change in what I would call um, uh, sick, maybe sick water, which could be akin to tap water. It's very disordered. I have a lot of compassion for tap water. It gets a bad rap. But that's only because we've put so, humans have put so much chemicals and crap in it. It's not the water's fault. Then we have to go through filtration and we have to do all of this. Um, but this is um, after global prayers were sent to tap water. It's completely transformed. There were 64 people from all around the world that sent love to the petri dish of water and my house. Um, and that was when I was back in New Zealand. I'm presently right in, in the States at the moment. And um, the, the, their prayers, their love, transformed it into one of the most beautiful pictures I have of, of water, of tap water. Um, I have done a, an ongoing study with egg white because I always thought, what, if, um, what would be the most informed water outside of seawater? It's got to be amniotic fluid. I believe that amniotic fluid within humans is actually one of the ways in which ancestral information is passed down. Now, what I'm seeing here, um, obviously I can't easily access um, amniotic fluid from people, so I went to the next big thing, which is egg white. And here's the two types of water and water thing that came up again. Um, egg white has two types of water in it. There is the gloopy, gelatinous part of the egg white, and then there is a thinner part, which is more akin to saliva. And when you freeze that, there are six patterns that form in healthy free-range eggs, whether that's quail eggs, whether that's um, goose or duck or chicken, and they all form these specific patterns. For example, this pattern here is the pattern that I would call the volcano. This is what I would call the flower and the others go around the side. Now, when I've tried and used uh, caged, battery-farmed chicken eggs that have gone through a lot of tra no, trauma from the mother, it fails to form structure. Maybe it will form one of those patterns at best. So I did something recently, because I've been coming out to the States quite regularly with various different, for various different reasons. And each time I would try to, to see what the crystallography of the eggs out here looked like. And I would buy, go to the farmer's market and I would get free range eggs and in the assumption that I would see something like this, because this is what I always see in New Zealand. But I kept seeing stuff that looks like maybe just two, two, two patterns, one looked more like this. And I'm like, this is this free range? What's going on? You know, I get them from the soup, from the from the um, from the market as well, like the actual like the store, um, and it was like organic, free range, and I wasn't really seeing anything very exciting at all, and I was getting really distraught, thinking, God, America can't be that bad. Like, was it chemtrails? Or like, what's going on? Like, what's going on? Is it the soil that the that the chickens are eating on? Like, it's not just about being free range, but what are they animals free ranging on? So I gave a talk, this health freedom talk, um, uh, about, about a month ago out in a place called Fillmore, which is near Ojai. And the lady had an organic farm. And um, anyway, I bought some of her eggs. And I was so relieved because I saw all these beautiful patterns again. And I'm like, oh, thank God, um, they're there. But they'd only been just laid the, that day. So freshness seems to play a part in that role. Now. This is a very, very new study, and it's very interesting. So what I observed is basically, um, this is what I normally see, this kind of interesting brain-type pattern. This was what I would see in most of the eggs I tried in America that I froze. This is the one from that place I just told you about. So I was happy to see that. Um, now, what I did here was 
take a free free range egg and um, a caged egg and I put them side by side overnight and this was what the caged egg improved normally I've never ever seen not in my lifetime of doing so many studies all of the caged eggs always look somewhat like this or somewhat like this I've never seen I even knew that they could improve but sit by sitting overnight next to a healthy egg they improved quite significantly so that was one study that of course then people anyone in the world that's ex that then applies that to people they're like yeah but what if you surround a good egg with a lot of bad eggs of course you're going to think that so I did that <laughs> here is the results so what I did was I took the I, I mean the, the caged egg and so I got a, I got a whole thing of caged eggs and I used one of the good eggs and I put the one good egg and surrounded it in circles with all the bad eggs and they and so what happened and then I put one of those bad eggs I mean I'm just using that as terminology <laughs> bad, bad eggs and I and I and I put it um, far away so and I froze that so this is what that egg looked like the the one that I did here so basically it's just sort of showing a pattern that I would was quite common that I would see but every single other egg that and this is in proximity to this egg every single other egg and you can see they're beautiful improved and as it's as the um, proximity got further away they become slightly slightly less um, ordered and you start to see slightly less imagery but you do see a lot more imagery than this so here's what I think is going on here what I think is that nature and I think this is important for us to also take into account nature especially in this embryonic stage at least is always looking to improve if we look out at nature the runts of a litter are usually don't don't survive um, sometimes animals will kill in their babies that are not healthy and certainly a lot of unhealthy or weak um, or injured animals don't last long in the animal kingdom and so at an embryonic stage what we are seeing is that of course that not thinking like humans might think like good eggs and bad eggs but actually the eggs with that have been through trauma are looking to heal and I think that people that are sick, when you actually get sick, no matter whether you're good or bad, there is this part inside of you that is really wanting to heal. Something opens up in you where you're like open to some people actually wanting to heal. And so there's something very significant in the study of which I need to do more of. But what I, what I think is that when a, pro, a healer somebody that has has really done the work or has these gifts or has knows their purpose is a, even just in proximity to another person that needs to heal whether it is a physical healing or an emotional healing a spiritual healing whatever that might be just proximity is starting to make a change when people start to heal themselves truly they are healing others and this is what this study is really showing us it's so important because I remember my teacher in India years ago before he transitioned and he was saying the greatest saints and people that have, have come to teach and be on this planet have been completely filled they are vessels of divine love and they will heal people that they will never meet because their energy their vibration their frequency will reach people so far across the world and have done that there is this wave of love and compassion which helps to heal and impact people in all the different ways and they don't even know why that's happening 
but that's why it's so important for us to really recognize within this I, container. I think we kind of live in two worlds, the world we live on and the world we live in. And within this container, within this world, we have so, we are an ocean. And we are so much more powerful, not the kind of power that overpowers people, but the kind of power that turns on lights. We are so incredibly powerful. Because we are water, salts, minerals, crystals, and consciousness. Um, that we have this ability to really heal and heal others. And so, as I continue on with this work and with this journey so much daily, I, I, I really do see water as an observer. And I go back into the two types of water. Um, I think there are two types of water in people. I think that there is this, um, the water that we drink that flows through our body, that hydrates our cells and helps us, um, you know, have all these different functions. Um, but also I think that there is this kind of drop of consciousness within us, this expression. And all throughout um, history, you will see that, that different kinds of texts will say that the soul, the spirit, or the subtle body leaves the body upon death. And they don't, no one ever really says how that happens. We, we don't exactly know how that happens yet. And again, this is um, kind of more about how what water has taught me and told me, and also what has come up um, through my inner understandings, and also having watched my mother transition, kind of seen it in a way for myself, as well as other people who have been sat with, who have passed. Um, there is this, this essence water. Like I said, it's, it's the kind of water that is always with us, that holds and, and stores and uh, enraptures our conscious expression. And I think that in the same way that I said, we have the... Um, the two worlds, the, the world we live on and the one we live in. And is there ever anything outside of the world that we experience? For example, we see out within our eyes, we see within the lens, it's coming, the pictures are seen, we see in this kind of inner way, we hear in an inner way, we touch and the feelings are expressed through our body, the sensations, we taste, it's taken inside of ourselves. All of these things are felt inside the body. But what do we actually ever experience outside? of the body. Well, we can observe ourselves. So we can observe ourselves. There is things we do outside of this physical body. How do we observe ourselves? Well, I think it's very relative to the way in which when the, the soul spirit transitions, there is this route. And so if you think about the fact that we have electrical charge in the body. Heart math will tell you how far the, the electrical charge of the heart is in the different the fields around the human body. Um, and we are surrounded by water right now in the air, but we don't think about it. Some of that water is going to be attracted to your electrical charge and that field. So we literally are walking around with like a web of energy around us, of information around us. This is why we can walk into a room that has had some bad energy in it or some, some horrible thing might have happened and we can feel it because the water is communicating. There is a resonance still within the air, the water in the air that is holding that information. When we walk into it, our web literally can feel it and the information is transferred and we feel it as a feeling, as a sensation because Water is really like emotion that we can that we can see outside of ourselves, and one of the ways we do that is um, tears. In our deepest sorrow, we cry, and we can literally see, taste, and touch emotion. But our our our, our this human system is so sophisticated that our face, when we cry, our face is designed a certain way. 
Our body is creating its own medicine. I think it's important we remember that too. We can create our own medicine. We are so much more than mostly we think. And so our eyes, when we cry, the tears come back around and you'll notice and you'll remember from crying that they go towards your mouth. It's because they've been reordered and restructured to actually be taken into the mouth as a medicine to help heal your pain. And so <clears throat> within this idea that water is emotion that we can see, it's literally one of those things that's right in front of our faces that we are just missing, this missing link part. And so what I think is that because when I observe myself, and if I can do it right now, for some reason I'm always going to about here, and I can kind of see myself talking to you guys. I'm like, how, how am I doing that? Because it's in a really different state. And so because there is still life force energy in my body and I have electrical charge, I think that that essence water can go from a liquid to a vapor quite easily, working on that electrical charge. And so as when someone dies, the brain, even when your heart has stopped beating, still, still is firing for a certain amount of time, but the water is still moving for about an hour. They did studies, Jerry Pollock did studies, it's horrible really, but um, anyway, on a, on a rat, where they observed that even after a, an hour of the actual rat being dead, water was still moving through the body. And if there's water moving, there is an energy. And so, I interviewed a friend of mine, Hone Edmonds, a Maori guy from New Zealand, whose heart had stopped beating for 25 minutes. And he had a, a near-death experience that he basically wrote a book about. He said he felt himself um, rising. He looked down at his body and he was one of those people that said, oh, I hope that person's going to be okay. He immediately had become the observer. Uh, he went on to go through this corridor where he saw some... Um, pictures and he looked at each picture and he could see some other life and he was like, oh I, yeah I remember that. And then he came out and he said, interesting, he wasn't walking. He said his body, he was in a light body, he could see that he was in a physical body, like sorry, in a body, but it's like a light body, it looks like, like a white body. Um, and he was lying down actually, like floating along as if he was lying on a bed, but he wasn't. He was lying that way and he went through and he kind of floated along and then he came to the end where his grandfather and his son who had passed away were, except his son was grown up. And his grandmother was there as well. And he saw this beautiful white kind of perfect earth and he saw mountains with snow on them and these rivers and everything. Anyway, long story short, he ended up, his grandfather was giving him the choice to go back and he didn't want to go back but he also knew he had to go back. And he was really upset about it. And this is what really got me. He said, I got down on my knees and I started to cry and my tears fell on my grandfather's feet. I'm like, oh, you could cry in a subtle body. Tears were still there. So I think water transitions these different realms because we forget. We need to think about water. We just think about what we can, what we drink and shower in and bathe in and you know all the things we do with water um, but in fact I think you know water has a liquid a solid a gas um, a gel and within all of those stages are subtleties and the secrets are always in the subtleties and so I think that water is able to tra is, it does transition these different realms and these different phases and as I kind of go into this idea that because there was still some electrical charge, when he came back into his body, he was able to come back. When that electrical charge stops within the physical realm, the subtle, the, the subtle body, the spirit, is able to then transition. And kind of it goes from there. And, and But being able to be the observer when you're not in your body is a very important thing. It's the only thing that I can think of right off the top of my head at the moment that we really can experience. And other than the dream realm, dream realm is important. I've done multiple studies on dreams where I've basically put my petri dish of water 
um, beside my bed with the intention that it pick up some part of my dream. And then I'll freeze it in the morning. And this is done in complete darkness and it is not my conscious expression influencing the water, which a lot of people think is going on. So I'm not because I can't because I'm asleep. And so I'm in a subconscious, unconscious realm. But still, every time, not random. So this isn't like, I can't, and plus I can't take like a thousand photos or a hundred photos or even 20 photos really because ice melts so quickly. So this is um, happening before my eyes literally and I'm having to cap photos as fast as I can. But within that dream realm, what appears to be accompanying me somehow, observing what I'm observing, so many layers to this. And within that space, then I am seeing very clear imagery of what I'm dreaming. In fact, on the few, a rare occasion that I won't remember my dream, I'll see the photo that, of what water has designed and it will jog my memory. But it's, it's interesting what water chooses to design. What it felt the most significant thing of that dream was to show me. Um, because I have to remember that there's a, there's a message here for me or for us. And so as I kind of transition and go through that work, now I'm getting to the point where I want to invite water to become an active participant in my dream to see what it would show me. So I'm working towards that. I'm Actually, I'm working alongside a professor that's been studying dreams for going on 35 years now. And he was talking about how people can become very close and they can actually have this be, be involved in the same dream. Um, and he was thinking a great study would be to have people that have that ability, that have experienced that together, where they're dreaming the same dream, to actually see what collective dreaming may look like and how water may express that imagery. Um, and so what I'm finding is there is great significance within these realms of water that many may not have considered and that from a perspective of, of, of I mean, you know, we identify as many different things, but what bonds us is water. Really, truly, really the quality of water does tend to reflect the quality of life. And one of the things I have seen, because I've spent much time in India and I go out to the rural villages out there, and, um, you know, you, you really do see how tough it is to go and collect water. And the reverence that people that do not have water handy to just go to a tap and turn it on, the reverence that they have for water cannot go unnoticed. It, it's, it's, they recognize water really as life. And we, we really, when we go looking for water, especially on other planets, we're, we, you know, we're looking for life on other planets, we're looking for water. But no, one's, no one with, really within the science realm is willing to say that water is alive. In my culture, you know, we're one of the, the first, we were the first country in the world to give um, a river the rights of a human. The Whanganui tribe fought so hard to actually stop the, the mining of the gravel because they thought that was the, the raping and, the, and taking away the, the belly of the river. Its headwaters were um, moved and, and transitioned and cut off. And for them, that's aquatic decapitation because the head is the most sacred part for Maori. And the mouth of the river was being filled with effluence. They fought for years and the Crown finally agreed to allow them to be the caretakers of the river and actually give the river the rights of a person because they were saying, this is our ancestor. This is, this is our ancestor. Water is not a resource, it is source. And so within all of these aspects, I think there is definitely a wave of change happening in our world. And this work constantly 
amazes me and humbles me and surprises me and all of the different things that I, I get to feel. But within the relationship, so when people start doing this work, because I, you know, I, I, I was um, these well-meaning people. They said, oh, you need to monetize this technique you've, you've, you've got. You know, you need to like make it cost a fortune and make it exclusive and do all of this marketing crap. And I'm sorry, it's not my thing. <laughs> And I, I don't like all that. Well, you have to ask yourself why you do this in the first place. And for me, I know my worth. And I know how valuable this is. But not just in, not, it's not about monetary value, but it, it is important that we understand what value means to us, of course. But for me, this is message from a life life force energy How do you, and so what I've simply done is, is made it super affordable I've done more pro bono stuff than than anyone would approve of and and um, and and at the same time you know I have these very inexpensive really um, uh, workshops and PDFs that people can buy and so many people have gone in so many people have gone, oh my God, I don't want it for some marginalist. I was a single mum until I met the love of my life. I was been a single mum, you know, of three children for years. And I don't want someone who just doesn't have a lot of money not be able to afford to learn how to do this most important work. And with so many children now, our tamariki, our babies coming in and being homeschooled, it's a wonderful way for parents to be able to remind, actually, the children end up reminding us of really why, what we need to remember. This is just a wonderful platform for them to play in and remember in. In fact, I, I saw someone who did very, very deep etymology around the meaning of the word remember. And there, I won't go into all the details, but it's far beyond what most people would do. And in the end, as it was reduced, 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 it came into meaning to bear water again, which is very interesting. And so as we kind of go through this and as the babies and the children are doing this work, because I've gone into many, many schools before the whole COVID thing and, um, and I kind of mix it with an art and science project and the children get to see I mean, basically, I give them each um, a cup of water, they write their name on it, they think of something that they like, and then they write what they're thinking about. And I'll take all of these cups away, and I'll do all the freezing. If they've got a massive freezer at school, which isn't common, then we'll do it there. But, and then I just basically gift them all the photos. And then the children take them home and are like, look at this, mum. And the mum's going, what? What's that? And, and, you know, it's amazing. In New Zealand, Children are fascinated. The, the things they seem to love the most are grandmothers and guinea pigs. There's like the two big things in New Zealand that I get across the board. And I've seen so many guinea pigs now in ice, it's not funny. But, um, but you know, when, you, when they see that and they get excited, they don't even care what they get. They're just excited water's doing something cool. And, like, that water's like a shapeshifter and it can turn invisible. And, like, there's... There is so much around the way in which we can talk to children about water that makes it fun and that they're not falling asleep with boredom about just, well, it's H2O molecule, this and that. And I'll also say what's cool about when you look at the molecules, if you want to do that, is that you have two hydrogen molecules and one oxygen molecule. The two hydrogen molecules are feminine and they're in the, the element of levity. And the oxygen atom, the oxygen atom is actually in the mode of masculine and gravity. Together they're in beautiful balance and harmony. It's not about water being feminine or, or this or this or this or this. Water is in a, in a beautiful balance. And that is the reason why we can even have water on our planet. And so when we, when we start to do this, this reductionist thing is not so much always what I like 
in the very, very early times before the Romans um, made piping um, to take the sewage away, people would call water the waters. There was a reference to water as the waters. And when, when we started using water to take away our waste, it got reduced to water. And now we're kind of doing this H2O thing. But where the waters still plays in our language is where we say her waters broke. So there is that sacred word still attached to something sacred. And as we go through all of this, and we start to think about what can we do? How do we have relationship with water then? So I always say, before you, when you start out, don't go into this expecting water to show your face or show the plant or show the flower or all that kind of stuff of which you people see with my work. I suggest that you observe. You simply be the observer for a bit because what water will show you are its natural patterns. When you get to, if, especially if you're using tap water, if you use tap water, what you'll see is it will form its disordered patterns. But if you are naturally sen sen sending it love, or if you are, um, or if once you start doing something different with it, whether you vortex it or you filter it through silk, I spent a lot of time in India and I watched these ladies, they would hold their silk, the silk sari and one holding one side, one holding the other with the big um, water pump and they would, the pump, the water was going through the sari and they did that because that helps to um, firstly filter through the water, filter the water, but it also completely restructures it. Even Rudolf Steiner teaches his, children, his um, students to uh, like really filter water through silk. And um, Dr. Jerry Pollack says even putting silk beside water helps it starting to build that exclusion zone, that um, fourth phase of water. Exclusion zone means to exclude all solates. So basically it's a battery. So that part is negative and the other part of the water is positive. It's like a battery. And so that's a very interesting thing. And so these people have been doing this for more uh, throughout so many generations. So they already knew that. And um, I think when it comes to relationship anyway, if you start to know what the patterns look like before you launch into anything, then you can see when you've made a difference. You can see when something's changed. It's very much like, uh, and people always ask me this, oh, does, do you have to have like a freezer? So all you need to do this work is your regular freezer, a, a glass Petri dish. I prefer glass because basically glass is a type of silica, which is a type of crystal. We have crystals in all of our technology to store vast amounts of information. Um, I think it helps water to store information for longer. You get better results with glass Petri dishes than you do with plastic. Um, water in your imagination and, um, and basically a camera on your phone. I take all my photos on my iPhone. I see, and what I say to people is, when you're doing this work, um, take photos immediately. Don't go searching for the imagery because the ice will melt, you'll miss that opportunity. You can go through them all later. It's really, really fun to do that. I'm a little bit addicted to doing that. And so, um, as, so that's important. People say, does your freezer have to be like dedicated to the water? And that's not necessarily real life. Right now, the freezer I'm using is chock-a-block full of stuff. And um, I'm adapting to the new freezer here in the States. And um, what, anything that is already frozen is in a state of suspension. So you don't have to worry about water picking up on that information. People say, oh, do I need to um, be having it like a perfectly zen space with candles and incense and everything like that and be like, you know, in the space? And of course, maybe water would love that. And you'd probably love that if you can have that opportunity, but that's not also necessarily real life. You can do it if you like, and that would be great. But my real life doesn't always look like that. 
usually my life is like children running around, the next door neighbor's dog barking away, you know, stuff going, going, things happening, phone calls and blah, 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 like real life stuff. So when it comes to relationship, I say this relationship with water is kind of a love affair, really. Um, when you really like somebody and there's this connection and you or they ask you out on a date, and you go out to the cafe or the restaurant or wherever, you're so excited to see them, and your focus is on them. And, and as we know, you know, when you focus your light, your light is entering them, their, their light is entering you. And there's all kinds of stuff happens. The waiter or the waitress will come and serve you, and there'll be lots of people around you, there'll be all stuff coming, going on, but your focus is on that person. You're reading their energy. You're looking at their face and their features. You're listening to what they're saying. All of this kind of stuff goes on. And so whatever is going on around you doesn't matter because you're just happy you're there, having a bond, a relationship with the person. And so very much in the same way, as that relationship develops positively, if it's a healthy relationship, it's going to develop where you become more and more and more and more relaxed, more comfortable, more transparent, more yourself. Eventually it comes to a point where it really doesn't matter if your hair looks like absolute crazy in the morning and your breath could kill a goat. It doesn't matter because it is that part where that person loves you no matter what. They, 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 they really see you. And when someone really sees you, they're not just seeing you in the physical, they're feeling you so much deeper than that. There is a bond, there is a love. And so when it comes to this realm and relationship with water, that's why I always suggest that people just observe to begin with. Start, don't go from zero to hero and go like, right, you know, now I'm going to experiment on you. And that's not a relationship, not a healthy one. And so as we go into this, it's just more around staying in that place of curiosity, interest, respect. And it always starts with us, within us. We're bodies of water, of living water. And that is so important because everything I'm seeing really in this realm is reflections of what I'm seeing. We see everything, everything. If we can see Visually, we see everything through the realm and the lens of water because our eye lens is 99% highly ordered structured water. There is nothing we look at in this world that is not seen through water. So if eyes are the windows to the soul, then tears are an expression of spirit. And I think that when we see ourselves, when we see other people and we look them in the eye, there is a knowing, there is a recognition, there is a releasing. And we don't hold, need to hold on to all of this stuff that we collect that doesn't serve us anymore. If you think about what the human body can do, we can urinate. Urine is such a wonderful thing because you can simply release and when you, I always say, if you just take one glass of water, and that one glass of water, you, you say to it, and you think about it, and you think that this glass of water is able to flush away what I do not need anymore. And I always say to people, what was the last word you spoke before you drink water? Because I've done a lot of studies on saliva that suggest that it knows what you said. We tend not to think about what the last word we spoke was when we eat or drink, but that's the first thing your water, outside of your conscious expression, your water is going to actually come into contact with, is in your mouth, with the saliva. It's sharing information. It's not so much anymore, and I really don't think so, about what the water can do for you. There's all this thing about structuring the water and making the water so this and this and that so that it's going to heal you. You can heal yourself. That's all we actually ever do. 
we we can be given medicine, we can be given treatments, we can be given all of these different kinds of things, but it's your body that heals. You are the healer, you're healing. And so within that space, what can we then do to offer an environment for the water that is going to enter us? It is such an intimate thing that is going on because water and food become part of this beautiful body that we have, this beautiful temple that we have. And so as we start to form relationship and we think, oh, what was the last word? It's the power of prayer. It's why the ancients and many people pray or say something beautiful or they're grateful before they eat because that's the last word they spoke. It's in resonance. There's this vibration in your mouth which is going to take it in and assimilate it into this body that what is not needed what you don't want we think we don't have any power we have so much and we're able to then take that in that water that special water that we've said i'm going to, i want to use this water to take away what i no longer need so that then that can be transmuted back into see so whenever you release water through urination in our minds, we don't like the look of the toilet. No way people would like the idea of going down there. It's like, oh, hell no, I don't want to go down the toilet. <laughs> but that's not what water is like. Water doesn't think like that. Water isn't in the judgment. We don't even really know what it's like to not be in judgment. We judge everything, even the fact that we don't think it looks like fun to go down the toilet. We don't want to do that. Of course not. Nobody wants to go down the toilet. But water is going down there all the time. When it's not, no longer in the human body, it's no longer contained to fear. When it is released, it has no fear. It goes back to being of the observer. It's so simple. It's only this container, this container of memories. Really, we're so lucky, I mean, in so many ways. Because if we think about it, science can tell us that water can store vast amounts of information. There's lots of different studies that have been done on that on very scientific ways. Um, you need to look, you, can, you can look at Dr. Jerry Pollack's work specifically. And then if water stores information, yes, and people store information, we do, of course, we have memories. Well, if we look at our entire life, and we look at all, if we think back, all we can do about a second ago, it's the same thing as 20 years ago and same thing as when we were born. It's a memory. It's really a memory. We're bodies of water that make memories. And last year, my godfather, Dino, just, oh, I, used to, I spoke to him nearly every single day for 20 years. And he transitioned very suddenly. And I remembered, I realized in that moment that he was one of the best memories, as well as my mum, that he gave to me in my heart. It, it's the memories we leave in other people that are so, such gifts. And we say, if we can be the most beautiful memory in the hearts of somebody else, then we've given them such a gift that they can carry with them. And really that's what we're doing. We are creating memories that we're so, we're so amazing because like in the moment, this is what we have in this moment, in the moments of our life, we have to find the meaning. In every moment of our life to find the meaning of this life. And for me, this is a passion driven work this is passion-driven life. It doesn't feel like work because it's fun. But it involves, and it, it, there's, it touches on so many aspects of, of what it is to be human, like what it is to love. Um, and I've just seen the time, and I'm, I'm going to have to cut it really there. I'm so sorry because I, I have to hop on a, another call soon. No. But, do, you have time, <laughs> do you have time for any questions? I, I do. I've got, I've got about eight to ten minutes okay well if people have questions please uh 
chime in, raise your hand if you have a question. Um, I see Sadia has her hand up. Let me um, let me let Sadia answer a question. Thanks, Ask your question. Sorry. Thank you, Veda. That was amazing. It was phenomenal. I was just blown away by everything. I want to hear <laughs> way more, um, but it'll be really quick. Um, so I heard that water that's stored in like plastic or like for the tap water is kind of considered dead water. So what would you like recommend to bring it back to life? And then what kind of water do you drink? Some of my most commonly asked questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I always think the best water to drink is the water that's in your glass. Because there is a kind of uh, um, racism almost when it comes to water. <laughs> that we think one is better for the other because we're expecting something outside of ourselves to heal us. And so uh, all water has, has significance, even tap water and dead water. Um, although, of course, you want to be drinking healthy water. That's important. You know, you need to make sure that it doesn't have lots of heavy metals and all these kinds of things in it. So firstly, I love glass. And I always say to people, if they can get a blue glass container, um, a cobalt blue glass container, um, a friend of mine in Hawaii sells some really lovely ones, um, and she's called Blue Bottle Love. Now, the, the importance of blue glass and water and light. So you can put that blue glass bottle, get the best water you can. Um, I always say, if you can, there's a, there's a in America anyway, there's um, a website called Find a Spring. I think it's for all around the world. It helps you find a spring that's a drinkable spring where you can actually go to. There's a huge difference between going to collect water on a kind of pilgrimage and, and collect the water yourself compared to going to the store and buying water. A different relationship starts to happen. But it's, a lot of people cannot do that, of course, and that's not always viable for, for a lot of people. But um, what I'd say is um, when you collect the whatever what best water you can, put it into a blue container. It has to be glass and put it into the sunlight and leave it there for an hour or so. This is an actual ancient Hawaiian practice and it, um, it is said to basically help the water, the water that is in the light with that blue color. So blue is such a powerful color and I, I could probably talk an hour about the color blue, but I'll just tell you that it's a very powerful color. Um, and that it's also one of the last colors people were ever able to see. It's the last color humans could actually see. We saw all these other colors, but blue was the last one. And um, so when, when you do that, especially for people that have had trauma, it helps to take away anxiety. It helps to remove negative emotions. And it really does help to kind of flush away um, things that are not serving you. And it's kind of like a, they think of it as kind of like, uh, like a raising a lot of, of things that aren't healthy for you. But it also makes the water taste slightly sweeter. Um, the interaction with light is really important. But there, it's important that if you're using a living water, like water that, that's a spring water, for example, I happen to like spring water. I had a very powerful healing experience with spring water. It was spring water has, especially from if it's from a deep aquifer, has a lot of exclusion zone in it because it's under pressure and it's also surrounded with infrared light, which helps that exclusion zone expand, which is why um, it also has negative charge, which is important. And so when we're going into that kind of realm, um, I think that if you store your water in blue glass, keep it out of the light. So if you don't have blue glass, keep your water out of the light. Living water, like um, I always think all water is kind of living in a way, um, but spring water, for example, which you can get from the supermarket. If, worse, if, if you have to drink tap water, just drink filtered tap water. I'm not a fan of ionizing machines. It's essentially electrocuting water into submission 
And although there's a lot of people saying that, that there's this health benefit and that health benefit and this health benefit, the only real health benefit, I think, from ionized water is that it makes the water have more molecular hydrogen. But you can get just as effective molecular hydrogen gas. And I would say that that would be a better way rather than destroying the structure of the water. Um, and when you go to the supermarket, try to find a water that's actually in a darker glass because water doesn't like unnatural artificial light and it destroys it st structurally. It makes it very sad. Um, but you can just get whatever water you drink normally, put it into a, a bottle that's got some importance to you and hold it to your heart like as if it's a baby. Your, your heartbeat tells you what's going on in you. It's sharing information about where you're at in your life. Just like if you hold a seed in your mouth for however long, the saliva is sharing the information with the seed. When you plant the seed, the plant will grow with all of the extra minerals and things like that that you're lacking. So it's medicine for you. So when you hold the water to your heart, what you're going to find is that that water is receiving the information that you need and it will structurally change to become a kind of medicine for you. Um, so, I mean, you can also, to enliven your water, you can just, especially if you don't, a lot of people don't have a lot of money, so, but most people have got like a spoon, so you can like stir the water one way, stir the water the other way. Water loves to vortex. That's what it does in its natural environment. It doesn't like right angles. That's why it doesn't like piping. And it loses an electron when it goes through piping, um, which means it doesn't have as many as much scaffolding, should we say, to design. Um, you can get a little bit of silk and actually just filter your water through some silk. Um, you can, if you have a blender, you can put the water through that. It creates a kind of tornado. And you can simply put your thoughts towards the water and really connect with the water. Um, you, there are so many, many things you can actually do. There's all kinds of different restructuring devices on the system. We forget that's what we are, though. We are the destructuring system. We are the vortexing system. We actually really are. So if we actually just work on ourselves, in ancient times, the job of water was simply not to heal us. It was our job to make sure the water was healthy. It was our job to look after this body and the water within ourselves. Um, but on those practical notes, I mean, there's, I, I would stay away from anything that, that has a, anything to do with electricity too much. Don't microwave water. <laughs> the, it, just, it really destroys the structure. I've shared multiple photos of before and afters of what that looks like. Um, and even uh, uh, a lot of things with EMF. Um, so uh, the, the encouraging thing, I think, is that one of the things EMF takes away is um, magnesium. So if we make sure that we have a lot of magnesium within our body or magnesium rubs, these things can be very helpful. I know I'm off topic now, but um, I can go on for ages. But I hope that that was help, some help. <laughs> thank you so much. Well, I just real, I really want to say thank you. We want to make sure you get to your next commitment on time. But I'm just going to put your book cover up for people to see. Um, it's called The Secret Intelligence of Water, and it has all of her beautiful images as well as how to contact her and how to, um, how to learn how to do the process for yourself if you're interested. Yeah, you can go on my website and um, just learn how to, to actually do it all yourself. Or I've got a, a workshop coming up on, the, um, on April the 30th. Um, so basically, I, I always recommend them because you get everything. You get the guide and you get the hydroglyph PDF and you get time with me where I keep the group small so that everybody's able to um, I help because everyone's freezer setting is different. 
So I help them see exactly what they're looking for because that's the most confusing part for some people. And my website's vedaaustin.com, V-E-D-A, austin.com. Um, and yeah, more than happy to help anybody. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. I think there are probably a million questions, but we are out of time. And we would, if you ever want to come back, we'd love to have you back. Yeah, I can do a, a question answering time if you like next time. So perfect. Um, that sounds great. All right, so thank you so much. Many, many blessings. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you to everybody. I'm really, really grateful for all of you. Thank you for all the wonderful work you're all doing. Very, very grateful. Thank bye -bye. you so much. Bye bye. Well, everyone, that was amazing. And um, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Mayumi for a minute to, um, to do a little closing. And, if um, I also want to share something uh, because I saw a talk from uh, Into the Mythica with Jocelyn and she was interviewing Dr. Maria Ward, who is um, very much involved in uh, the unconsciousness and dream work and psychology and see showed this sort of picture you may all be aware of it but for me it was just another perspective just from the earth and seeing the pacific ocean just on one side and on the other side is all the land so it's kind of the yin and the yang and she kind of also mentioned like um it is also the unconsciousness and that you know we as humanity should also tap into that more and even though it is unconscious, but it also has the consciousness as well. And I thought it was just a, another way uh, of seeing this perspective. And um, yeah, that the waters on the earth is about two thirds, but also in our bodies, or maybe even more than that. So it's just so all related. And um, yeah, I just wanted to share that as well. So um, let me pick uh, the poem uh, that we selected um, so it's a, a black water pond by mary oliver uh, at black water pond the tossed waters have settled after a night of rain i dip my cupped hands i drink a long time it tastes like stone leaves fire it falls cold into my body waking the bones I hear them deep inside me, whispering, oh, what is that beautiful thing that just happened? So it kind of all really tunes in nice, nicely with Veda's amazing talk. Um, there's probably not really much that I can add to her amazingness, but for the closing, I would like to invite you all to, uh, yeah, maybe close your eyes and that we are in a circle and connected and with the waters. And I thought also to call upon um, the goddess of the sea uh, in the Enyun, we say Mama Kocha, and the goddess of the rivers and the lakes is Mama Ojo. And then we connect with each other and these beautiful goddess and spirits the water spirit and then we kind of zoom out and see that perspective of the earth as i just mentioned on the one side we see all the waters the pacific ocean and on the other side the land we live on like the yin and the yang and then we embrace all of these beautiful waters and the waters within us and that we can connect with these waters and shine light on these waters also for humanity that even a little bit of light can shed some of that unconsciousness that is actually yet conscious and just to remember And I just want to stay there for a moment with you all and to shine that light. And 
that's it. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend.